This podcast, Depraved Heart Murder, The Tupelo Presleys, is a creation of Southern Fried Chicky Productions, LLC, and was produced in Sun Bear Studio in Ripley, Mississippi. The material presented in this podcast is for general information purposes only. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast interviews do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Southern Fried Chicky Productions, LLC, or Sun Bear Studio, LLC. Hey y'all, this is Christy McBrayer. I'm the principal member of Southern Fried Chicky Productions, LLC, and your podcast host. This podcast represents the culmination of my 20-year obsession with this fascinating story that occurred in my Mississippi hometown. I hope you enjoy Depraved Heart Murder, the Tupelo Presleys. Well, on this episode three of Depraved Heart Murdered the Mississippi Presleys, I am going to be having a good time here because I have got our producer, the Melinda Marsalis of Sun Bear Studios, who has been doing all of this work and research with me throughout all of this podcast. And it's so fun to have a little bit of a conversation with uh, Melinda today. So... Yeah, so Christy, I got a bone to pick with you. Oh, dear. You know, when you said you wanted to do a little podcast a year ago. Yes. I didn't think we'd still be working on it (laughs) eight months later. (laughs) Well, don't forget that I've been researching this for seven years. So it's a long time in the making, a labor of love for both of us. Absolutely. And it's (laughs) the story is so hard to grasp that I think this little conversation between us might help listeners answer some questions that they have. As I well. think you're right. I think this is fantastic. I'll, so I'll try to speak for all the people listening. Okay, great. So you're going to fire off a few questions for yeah, me? Yes. Okay. So Harold Ray is the Presley brother that was shot. He was the sheriff. This is correct. Who is Larry Presley? Okay, Larry Presley is one of Harold Ray's brothers. He was a retired police officer when Harold Ray was shot and killed, and he won the sheriff's seat for his brother Harold Ray in a special election. By the way, he was also defeated in the next election by who is currently the sheriff of Lee County, Sheriff Jim Johnson, of whom we've had... Uh, a few interviews with. Uh, unfortunately, wait a minute. Yes, is, is Larry Presley the one that fired Jim Johnson? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so he didn't rehire him. I wouldn't say okay. he fired him. He did not keep him in his administration when Larry Presley won the special election. See what happened was is that. After Harold Ray was killed, then Jim Johnson took over as interim sheriff. And then there was a special election, and then that's when Larry Presley won the special election, and he decided not to keep Jim Johnson. Oh, too many roosters in the hen house. Apparently so. Okay, I get it. I get it. I mean... You know, that sort of thing happens. It happens. It happens when new administrations come in with anything, whether it's education, law enforcement, or whatever. People kind of get rid of people or don't invite them back. Right. So then that is when Sheriff Jim Johnson told me that he didn't know for sure. He had no hard feelings. However, uh, he decided to run for sheriff against Larry Presley, and Sheriff Jim Johnson beat. Larry Presley. And he's still sheriff now, Jim Johnson Jim is, Johnson right? is, and unfortunately, uh, Larry Presley passed away about three months ago from right now. He passed okay. away from a long illness. So maybe like March of 23, something like yes, that? Yes, okay. I believe so. Oh, so let's see, would he have been 70? He was in his 70s. In his 70s, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. And he's the brother of Harold Ray who was shot, the sheriff that was shot. Okay, I've got that part now. Not to mention that he was also the uncle of Brandon Presley, who right now is currently running for governor. Okay. That we've mentioned often. Harold Ray and Larry are Brandon's uncles. That is correct. 
Okay. And Brandon is very proud of both of them being in law enforcement and, as a matter of fact, just made a huge uh, political speech where he brought Harold Ray's actual badge with him. He talks about him. He talks about his, uh, his father who was murdered, Arnold. Oh, their brother, that third Presley brother, Larry and Harold Ray's brother. Arnold. Arnold is... Brandon's daddy. Brandon's and, daddy. And he was murdered. He was or murdered. killed. Murdered. Murdered. Shot. Okay. And then that's when Harold Ray sort of adopted Brandon. Okay. And then that's what got Brandon into law enforcement. I can speak for him because he says it all the time. <laughs> that's the only reason. Okay, I'm going to tell you a funny little story. My aunt was Brandon's teacher. When Brandon was in fifth grade at Nettleton. Wow. And she says that in all of his spare time, he drew political posters. So he was into politics way back in the fifth way grade. Way back in those days, and he always attributes it because, as a matter of fact, I believe that he took off from school when he was maybe third grade, around that time. I'd have to look it up, but he took off of school for an entire week to campaign for his uncle, Harold Ray, who did win the election. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that cute? Yeah, so he's been in politics forever, all his life. Knows nothing else. That's awesome. Okay, yeah. all right, I've got it. Can we go on to some lawyers? Oh, gosh, yes. There's so many famous lawyers in here. It's like a who's who. Who's who of the lawyers of Mississippi? Who's crooked? Who's not crooked? Who's famous? Who's famous? Okay, let's just start with Jason Shelton. Let's do. All right, tell me about who he is and how he's involved in this story. Okay, so Jason Shelton is the attorney or was the attorney for both Jada in all of her trials, Jada Presley, and in the depraved heart murder trial for Patrick Presley. Uh, from what I understand, Jason... She, wait a minute. Sure. He was the lawyer for both? Yes. Okay. All trials for both of the Presleys. All of the trials for Jada... And the big one for Patrick. Are they related somehow? They have always been very good friends because, as we are very well aware, this is a small town in the right. small world. So they grew up together, and they were good friends. The Sheltons and the Presleys apparently had known each other forever. So, therefore, uh, Jason, uh, the law firm, the Shelton law firm, represented both of them during this. All, in all of their... All of it. Going, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, don't apologize. It's very convoluted, and I think it's wonderful that everybody can get this straight. So there's that. And then Jason Shelton, uh, fast forward to 2013, runs for mayor of Tupelo and wins the seat and is reelected for a second term. And then just this last term, he decided not to. He's a Democrat, and he decided to go on to other things. And I just looked it up that Jason Shelton was appointed by the Biden-Harris administration as Regional Administrator of General Services Administration. They call that the GSA. What is that? I didn't know either. So... I looked it up, and it provides workplaces by constructing, managing, and preserving government buildings by leasing and managing commercial real estate. But the big deal of it is he got appointed by the president and the vice president. That's pretty dang big. I think that's impressive. That's and a reason to leave being the mayor behind. Mayor of Tupelo. But I, I, I will say, have you ever met Jason? No. I like him. He's a good guy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've listened to his speeches and things, mm -hmm. but um, I don't know him personally. Okay. But I did meet Victor. Oh, yes. And Victor ran against the current mayor of Tupelo. That is correct. So Victor Flietes is our legal expert, as we call him, Melinda here for our podcast. And he just recently did run for mayor and he gave a big formidable try. try. He did a great job, um, but he's not originally from here and not originally from Tupelo. So he did not win. And Okay. And so Victor, though, has been here long enough. He knows all the players. He knows everybody. He he went to Ole Miss Law School and then moved to Tupelo and opened up a practice. Well, actually, he had he worked as uh, a baby lawyer, as they call it. I think he said, you know, young lawyer. 
uh, in Tupelo and then proceeded to have his own practice. So he's been around and practicing law here in northeast Mississippi for decades. You were really lucky to get him to explain because as I listened to you guys interview from the production room, Mm -hmm. I was really thankful that he could explain what depraved heart murder was and he could explain why this would matter and why this signature would matter it it, that was real helpful it's very helpful and he's so informative but in addition to his knowledge of the law as he is a law professor actually at uh, Ole Miss as well adjunct but he knows the players he was around when all of it happened all right so we got Jason Shelton and Victor Flietis, and Jason is um, the lawyer for the Presleys often with when the kids get in trouble. And then Victor was not a lawyer involved, but he knows all the players. Right. Right. And he's our legal expert throughout this whole podcast. Yes. Okay, great. Now, I was reading as you were uh, putting some things together about the deputies. Well, first, I, I need to ask you to explain about what the deputies had gotten charged with. And then I want to talk about their lawyers because as I was reading your notes before you went in the production room, I saw some of the names and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is like the A-list of lawyers. And so first of all, explain to me why those deputies, were they arrested? Oh, yeah, uh, yes, they were on trial and they were on trial for violating the civil rights of the gunman, who was Billy Ray Stone, who the car chase and the kidnapper and all of that occurred, and they were charged for violating his civil rights. Now, Wait, what does that mean? I mean, what it, what happened? Okay, what's the backstory on that? Okay. The deputies were accused of violating the civil rights by stomping and beating the handcuffed man after he killed Sheriff Harold Ray Presley in the shootout. Was Billy Ray Stone dead at the time that they were kicking him? Okay, now this is something that we could never say because we don't know. I will say for a fact that they were acquitted. And I think that that's the long and short of the deal. They were acquitted of it. However, so that was the the kind of sketchy thing there that they went to trial because it was sketchy. But they the judge determined was it a judge or a jury? Jury. Actually, okay. it was. I believe the the trial lasted. It was in Greenville, Mississippi, and it lasted for five days, I think. And in three hours, they came back with the verdict of not guilty. Not guilty of okay. So. They were, if they were his deputies and he was this big, larger than life sheriff, they were probably furious when they, I can imagine the emotions had to be running high. They loved Sheriff Harold Ray Presley. And I have to say this, you know, we have discussed this so many times. The rumor mill is insane. Right. And I've had people tell me. For a very long time that the deputies, some people, they think that the deputies shot Harold Ray. I've told you many times, Melinda, and I tell everybody that I do my best to not have a major opinion with all of this. But I can personally say from my seven years of research that I do not believe for one second that that happened. Those deputies adored Harold Ray Presley. Yeah, so that would be one big rumor that the... The deputies were in on it. They were bad guys. Or that Billy Ray Stone was alive when the deputies started kicking him, and they killed him by kicking him. Instead of he was shot dead, and then they kicked him just being mad. Well, that's what they were accused of doing. They weren't accused of killing Billy Ray Stone. The bullet that killed Billy Ray Stone on the record came from Sheriff Harold Ray. I see. Okay. So he was for sure dead. They just kicked him after he was dead because they were mad and upset. Or uh, they were accused of that. They were accused of beating him Uh, up after he was dead. And that's why they call it violating the civil rights. I see. So you've got civil rights even when you're dead. Apparently so. Okay. All right. 
And uh, Billy Ray Stone's daughter said that the jury ignored the testimony by many of the witnesses, including Stanford's brother, Ken, who I, I interviewed him and we have him here on the podcast, Ken Stanford. And he was the EMT on the scene. Wait, wait, stop. So, <laughs> so there's brothers. One of them is a deputy. Correct. On the scene. And one of them is an emergency first responder on the scene. And th- these two men are brothers. And one had to to testify against the other? Had to testify as we have in one of our interviews that I had done years ago. They really bullied According to Ken Stanford, they they threatened him within an inch of his life. Oh, the that feds guy. did. Okay, yes. that guy. So he said the feds came in and bullied him to say what? Said that they were going they threatened him, said that they were going to take his job, his family, his house. They were you know, this is what according to Ken, that he was threatened and they thought that he was a co conspirator. They were saying that. So it was almost like what you see in the 2020s and datelines when they bring them in there and tell them, you know, I'm going to do this and this happened and this, and, and, and they just scared them and used those scare tactics to try to get them to go along with what they want them to say. Oh, my gosh. That made a kind of an awkward Thanksgiving dinner the next you, year. One would think uh, that both of them went through a whole lot, and then on an extremely sad note... Ken Stanford passed away from natural causes just about two years ago. So it was about five years after I had interviewed him. And he was such a lovely man. He was just as sweet as he could be. Okay, and that's Ken Stanford. Ken Stanford passed away. He was the EMT. Jason Where's, Stanford was his, is his brother. Where's he? Apparently, he's doing well and out of law enforcement. Dillard actually currently is running for the second time for the sheriff's seat of Union County, neighboring Union County. The other deputy yes. is running for sheriff. He's not sheriff right now. Well, as we say this in, in late July... We don't know if he won that race or not, but he is running for sheriff, and he ran before. He ran before, and he lost, and he's running again, and he could win of Union County. Of Union County. So he stayed in law enforcement. He just left that county and came to a neighboring one. Okay. So you guys listening to this, you know more than we do right now. We don't know if he won or not. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what's so interesting about these two deputies is who their lawyers were. It's amazing. All right, so you tell it. Okay. (laughs) So Tony Farise represented Danny Dillard. Let me tell you about Tony Farise. Let's talk about him. The Tony Farise. The Tony Farise. Okay. Wouldn't you say that he is probably considered to be the most renowned and successful attorney in Northeast Mississippi? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just going to tell you, Melinda, that if I were accused of murder, then I couldn't afford him, but I think my family would take second mortgages out and I'd get a GoFundMe because that's who I would want to represent me. I've thought that a lot, too. If I ever get in big trouble, I hope I can find enough money to hire Tony. Yes. (laughs) Because he is a fierce litigator. They have a hard and fast rule that everybody deserves a good lawyer. Everybody deserves a hearty defense and he means to give it to them. This is an ex- this is a great example of a, a gray area where emotions are high. Everybody's pointing fingers at each other. These deputies probably were just being honorable men and there was a big mess. And Tony came in and helped clean it up. I would I would go as far as to say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now Tony's <laughs> Tony Tony Freeze is big enough, but he's not the only one. Who's the other lawyer? Wait for it, Joey Langston. <laughs> no way. He represented Jason Stanford. Well, he apparently in '07 was trial lawyer of the year. 
He had won millions of dollars in his decades-long career in landmark cases. You know, uh, William Faulkner, who wrote about North Mississippi and is world famous, he said, and he is so right, that if you want to understand the world, you have to understand a place like Mississippi. And it's just true. There, There is no black and white, right and wrong, good guy, bad guy. I struggle with that because I'm a very black and white person. Like either you're right or you're wrong. I'm a math teacher. It's either the right answer or the wrong answer. But that is just not life. That's not how it is. And that's this whole story is like that. There's so much gray area. I think maybe it's more of the English major in me and the Libra that I can see. So not everything not everything is right. Not everything is wrong. Yeah, there's no bad guys in this story. There's people. There's people who have done some great things. There's people who did some maybe sketchy things. It's just complicated. It's, it's complicated. complicated around here. Can we go to the trial? You said it was in Greenville? Yes. Why was it held in Greenville? Do you know that? The federal trial, I think sometimes they must have wanted to get, obviously they wanted to get it out of this jurisdiction. Yeah, because so everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody here, as we have just <laughs> laid out very easily. So they moved it to the Mississippi Delta. Okay. And, well, we just said that there's no villains in this story, but Billy Ray Stone I, I mean, I guess it's complicated and we just don't know enough about him. We don't. And I will say that his daughter was very clearly upset about all of this with the civil rights. Uh, her attorney is a woman named Christy McCoy, and she represented uh, the Stone family in this civil suit. The daughter is is named uh, Shoop, is her last name, and she went to that trial and she wore a t-shirt bearing a color photograph and the name of her late father on the front with the words, Stop Police Brutality. Yeah, so it's just complicated. Yes. It's complicated. Even though it seems to me like he had to be the bad guy because he kidnapped that poor woman and... And we don't know why. And we never why. will, I don't think. Yeah, there's so much about this story that we're we're just asking our listeners to listen to the story and not judge it yes yes not come to any conclusions you just, make your own decisions yeah. you make it because we we are just coming in here telling the layers of this story we don't know who is bad we don't know who is good actually i think it Everyone has both of these things, as you just said. Yeah. Yes. The The longer we try to put this story together, the more I think that this is, there is, there ain't no good guys. <laughs> there ain't no bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's just all it is. And when it comes to, to Billy Ray Stone, we have discussed this, and I think that Everyone, everyone we've interviewed, Melinda, anybody we talked to, Billy Ray Stone did set the cycle. We don't know why, but as we discussed with Victor, as I discussed with Jim Johnson, this started it all. It feels like Billy Ray Stone started it. But, hey, who knows what came before that? We don't. Who knows what drove him to that? We we do not know, and we don't know what the connection is with him and the Charlene Wright that he did kidnap, nude, bound. That poor woman. That poor woman. And so, actually, there was a quote that I think is the truth on this. Um, Zach Scruggs, who I not, was with Joey Langston, in this, in representing Jason Stanford. He said, I don't believe a jury in Mississippi is going to award money to a family of a man who killed a sheriff. Now, the reason of that is, is because there were suits, lawsuits going on. They, Charlene filed a suit against the Stone family because they filed a suit against them because of the harsh treatment and violation of civil rights, which basically means 
beat the crap out of somebody after they were dead. Now, I don't know whether that happened or not, but that's what they were accused to do. And quite frankly, they they were accused of beating up a dead man. And and I mean, according to your notes mm-hmm. that I'm looking at, uh, Dillard's attorney was Tony Farise, and Tony felt like. Uh, Billy Ray Stone was just a bad guy. This wasn't a, this wasn't his first rodeo. In other words, he he'd been being bad for a while. I mean, but we can't find anything of his prior there, record. Okay, so there, <laughs> and it was like the Wild West. This big shootout that occurred. It was it was like something you'd see on The Sopranos. Yeah. Okay. Do you mind? Can we go back to that night? Absolutely. Okay, because the first time that you told me this story. So many months ago, mm-hmm. I thought that Billy Ray Stone pulled up to a police presence and saw that there were police and then took off and they chased him down. He shoves out Charlene Wright and goes to a straight into a, some barn nearby. That's not exactly what happened, is it? It was insane. There were shooting. It was shooting everywhere. It was, he had kidnapped her on Green Street, from what we understand, in Tupelo. Okay. Right that night? Yes. That early in the, earlier in the evening, he had her for hours. And so, it had been called in, from what I understand, and that's why there were police checkpoints, because they were looking for him with her in the car. He saw the police checkpoint. He had her in the car with him, nude and bound with duct tape and gagged. And then he goes, he shoots at the checkpoint. He shoots those deputies out the window. We're talking about cars going here with the shootout. Then he either pushed her out of the vehicle or maybe she got the door open maybe she made a last ditch effort yeah to to, jump to jump out and then that is when sheriff harold ray presley was behind them oh my and unfortunately ran over this woman and he was devastated yeah because i mean out comes a body from a car and you can't stop in time and then He took off his bulletproof vest out of being upset with that, and maybe to cover her up. You know, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, that could be because there she's laying there naked, and maybe being a gentleman, you know, lay something across her just for modesty's sake. That is a major. It would be a manly thing to do. I, I, out of all of my research and my hypotheses and everything else, I've never thought of that, Melinda, but that makes sense. Well, a nice man would do that. You know, you wouldn't want some woman laying there. Naked. Yeah, uh, exposed to everybody. And according to Jim Johnson, the current sheriff who got the call in, he was able to let Sheriff Harold Ray Presley know that she was alive. But And he was thrilled to know that she was alive. And then he went out. After he went crazy when he knew that and went after Billy Ray Stone, and so they're like chasing down, the chasing road. all over the place. And Sheriff Presley actually passed away before knowing that he had that unfortunately Charlie. run over the lady, and she passed away from her her injuries later. So he was shot to death, and then in a a couple hours later, she also died. They died several hours within. Okay. Okay. I think she made it for about two days. Okay. She had punctures, you know, because uh, she had been run over. Actually, from what I understand, the wheel had been shot. Oh. And ran over with the rim. Oh, my lands. Instead of an actual, the tire. Oh, my gosh, that poor woman. Okay. So... So, she gets hurt. He stops to try and help somehow. And then he jumps in his car, gives chase. Fast and furious. He's mad now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, he doesn't... Billy Ray does not... Doesn't he have a wreck? Doesn't he go off on foot into the Oh, yeah, he does. He finally just goes by... Yeah, he, he he kind of had a little bit of a wreck, and then he goes on foot, and he runs into these... Some people call it a shop, an outhouse. 
behind who is a retired police officer's home. Oh, my gosh. Robert Norris. And Robert Norris was also shot that night. By who? Do we know? We don't know. He was shot. Okay. And he still has a bullet lodged as as Stanford, Ken Stanford, the EMT, told us in the interview that it could easily be removed. And there are many, 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 many people, including myself, who believe that he knows something and he ain't talking, and if he would speak and get that bullet removed, we might know more. Wow. And I'm working on trying to talk to him. Wow. Okay, so so Billy Ray Stone wrecks his car, takes off on foot through the woods, ends up at the property of a former police officer. <laughs> Not the sheriff's department, but the police right. department. Mm-hmm. But a law officer in his outbuilding. Mm-hmm. And then... Coincidentally. Calls the law because his dogs are barking. The dogs are barking. A police officer called the law because his dogs were barking. That is what they say in all of these articles from the Tupelo Daily Journal, as many, many local periodicals. Somehow or other, the cops found... I mean, the d- sheriff's deputies were made aware of where Billy Ray was holed up. And they were running through here in the shootout that happened. But what we are told by nobody who was there (laughs) is that Harold Ray busted up in there. He shot Billy Ray Stone with one bullet. Only one bullet was found in Billy Ray Stone that killed him. And Billy Ray Stone fired several times. They say that Jack Tate, who was a very young deputy who won't speak to anybody about anything, that Harold Ray pushed him out of the way to keep him from being shot. Uh, Stop. Say that again. So there's this little kid, like young, 20-something. I'm guessing, yep. 20-something-year-old deputy. Mm Mm-hmm. And Harold Ray shoves him out of the way. Mm Mm-hmm. And takes the bullet. And takes a bullet for the young man. And because he's taken off his bulletproof vest for whatever reason. Which we think might have possibly been that that he was being gentlemanly. Yes. Yes. I I, I would hope somebody would cover me up. I would too. Not leave me laying there. That's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. So he's being chivalrous or whatever. He doesn't have his bulletproof vest on and he takes the bullet because he's shoved this kid deputy out of the way this is the folklore this is what this is the report this is what people say and he takes the bullet and is dead when his other deputies arrive yes no wonder they were angry they were pissed and so they were angry and then sheriff jim johnson who was not the sheriff at the time at all he was an investigator um he showed up And he says that he walked out, and when he came back in, the posture was different on Billy Ray Stone. Oh, like the body looked like it is. He had to testify that he would. He says those those deputies were acquitted, and he respects and likes those deputies, and he wouldn't say anything else now let me say i'm looking at some of my notes right now melinda let me bring up something here so shelly shoop is the daughter of, of billy, billy ray, ray stone, stone. Ooh, i've been listening okay paying attention now she said it doesn't matter what my father did he deserved to live to have a trial and she said the verdict sends a message that law enforcement can do anything that they want Then Shoup said that the jury ignored testimony by many of the 10 prosecution witnesses, including Jason Stanford's brother, Ken, who we interviewed, and said that Ken told jurors that Jason Stanford stomped stone with his foot and said, you're going to die tonight. That's a testimony? Testimony. Wow. So, and... I'm glad that we're making clear that we are not trying to 
come up with the answer to what happened that night because my goodness like you said nobody there's so many different stories melinda and i'm talking different periodicals different newspapers say different things yeah people who were on the scene in and out have different stories just to tell the story and tell some of the layers of it i think is a great goal for us and just say here's a southern gothic story you're not kidding at its best and others testified that dillard hit stone with a flashlight after stone was on the ground and that his hands were cuffed behind his back and stopped a paramedic from treating the suspect this is what some testimony said but danny dillard said he was happy to get quote our side of the story out and he was ready to get to go back to work and do what he was trained to do and tony farise said we represented the good guys stone was a serial killer who tried to kill everyone he saw so you you just have to step back about 10 paces and look at this from a lot of different opinions a lot of different strong opinions yes Hey, what happened to the kid, the deputy, the the young deputy that Harold Ray pushed out of the way? He's fine, and he won't talk, and nobody really knows where he is. Okay, so he'd be about 40, I guess. Yeah, probably older than that. Probably about 45 now. In my notes, it said that the uh, defense attorneys uh, said that Deputy Jack Tate admitted hitting Stone four or five times in the head with a flashlight. And that was a key element. This is new information that I just have in this note. Where did that come from? The Clarion Ledger. Okay. Which is the Jackson. For those of you who are not from Mississippi, the Clarion Ledger is out of Jackson, Mississippi, the capital of the state, and it's the statewide. The big paper. It's the big paper. So I didn't know this. So if Deputy Jack Tate, he was the young kid, who they say Harold Ray pushed out of the line of fire and was hit. If that's true, then he went over and started hitting Stone after he w- had been shot. Yes. And there, I mean, you could say, well, that could have been, and then fill in the blank. Exactly. It could have been a lot of things. Lots of things. Okay, Christy, we're not going to solve that mystery, are we? No, nope. nobody, unless uh, Robert Norris whose land that that was on, who called the cops, who was a former cop, retired. He was there, and he was shot, and he still has a bullet, and he will not talk to anybody, but he is the only person that was there while the shootings were going on that knows what happened. Wow. Or maybe he didn't see it. You know, like Ken Stanford in the interview, who was the EMT of whom we just were talking about, he said he was, quote, shocky, and he was afraid he was going to die. So he may not remember anything, too. Right, sure. Yeah. Mystery in a mystery. Wrapped in an enigma. (laughs) (laughs) All right. What is, yeah, because how long ago did this happen? In 02, I believe. Okay. So, 21-ish years ago, all of this happened. Correct. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now, I think this is a good time to pivot because this is a three-part story that, that we're telling here. And you've told part one really well. I mean, we can see all the sides of the s- story of what happened to Harold Ray that night and why it mattered so much to all the people in Lee County. This was no, this was not a nobody. This was a legend. A legend, absolutely. And a cousin of Elvis Presley. Right, right. So it had national ramifications. Yes. All of that. It had, it had sex appeal. Yes, exactly. (laughs) It played well in the papers and all that. Absolutely. Okay. So Harold Ray is just chapter one. Harold Ray is just chapter one and Harold Ray Presley has some kids and they also are complicated to say the least. All right. So in the wake, I mean, it's, it's like, it truly is like, you know, that first tsunami 
wave that comes. Yes. And then there's this moment of nothing. And then the waves start coming back and forth. That's what's about to happen. Because Harold Ray dies and then right on its heels, this whole thing with Jada happens, the whole thing with Patrick happens, and that's what's coming up in the next episodes. Yes, it is. And it is phenomenal. It is it, the amount of things that happen in such a short period of time, like you said, a tsunami. It goes shoop. Sheriff Harold Ray Presley is killed. And then the next year, his son goes down the wrong side of the highway and unfortunately kills a woman and goes on trial for depraved heart murder and is found guilty in a very short trial in a very short period of time. They convicted him. During this time period, that happened. Jada gets in the bar fight, bites the police officer. She winds up going on trial. She also goes on a trial that they allowed cameras for the first time in a courtroom in Lee County. Are these are these children of his? Are they like in their 30s, 40s? At now or at the time? At the time. At the time she, Jada Presley was 24. Oh, she's a kid. A, a little old kid. Okay. Okay. She was 24 years old. Patrick was 30. Okay, grown. And then yeah. Brad, who did get into too much trouble, but I think he got a DUI at the same time of all of this. They put that in the timelines, too. He's in the middle? He's the middle. Patrick is the oldest son, and then there's Brad, almost like Irish twins. So I'm guessing Brad was probably about 28 at that time. So Patrick, depraved heart murder charge, Jada assaulting a police officer, and Brad DUI. So they all wound up being in their daddy's jail within a year, about a year after he passed away. Okay, Christy, this is going to be fun. So three episodes down and a lot more story to come. Oh, yes. They need to be listening. I, and my gosh, you were so kind enough to take on this project after. Tell about what it was when I came in here with all of my notes. Isn't it hilarious? You were like, who is this weird woman? She's so disorganized and she's just. <laughs> Christy, I love a great big impossible task more than anything in the world. It's my thing. And so this felt impossible. And I thought, well, let's just see if we can do it. I'm not sure still that we're going to lick it. I mean, it's it may take us down. All I know is, first of all, you came from heaven for us to be able to do this because I had been working so hard, and it's so daunting, and it's so overbearing, and I needed help, help with it so desperately because of what you just said. And I don't know many people in this world who are willing to take on an impossible task, and you did. So I agree with you. We uh, might get taken down for, for, for a couple of reasons, but I will say that when I came for the first time and started getting into all this and I came in from Austin to interview people, my daddy said, you need to get out of here as soon as possible. I cannot tell you how many people were worried about my safety seven years ago when I lived away from here in, in doing this. But... Yeah, I get that, and I I like the way that we're going after this. As not we're we're not detectives who are going to come to a conclusion. You know, there's really no point in in my mind in finding out who did what at what time. It's interesting, but there's no need to know the truth because none of us ever know the whole truth. I would love to know the truth. <laughs> are you kidding me? Not me. Not me, because all, to me, always the truth is some shaded version of what this one thinks is true, and somebody else saw the exact same thing happen, and they interpreted it another way. So I've just decided that truth is sort of abstract. Well, this is definitely an abstract story <laughs> that I am so appreciative that uh, you jumped on board with. If anybody is left listening after all this, this is going to be fun. Y'all stay tuned. <laughs> Definitely. That was fun. I went out of my head. I'll get it back. What makes a depraved heart act? Was it all in the king's name that made the 
Depraved Heart Murder, The Tupelo Presleys, was written and directed by Christy McBrayer, produced, edited, mixed, and mastered by Melinda Marsalis in Sun Bear Studio. Original music by Bo Lindsay, Brad Elliott, and Christy McBrayer. Deanna Whaley, director of audio. Voice talent, Tom Park, Will Vance, Steve Bass, and Joyce Grady. Thank you to all of the people who graciously participated in interviews, and a very big thank you to Charlene Presley for allowing us the rights to her story and the use of her source material. Depraved Heart Murder, The Tupelo Presleys, is a Southern Fried Chicken copyrighted.